Rick Roller has been actually been teaching all day today. I don't know if you know that he's been busy all day today, but he still was willing to come and, and teach one more time for us tonight. And so we're really glad to have him be here with us. He's a really smart guy. Uh, he trained how many, uh, how many did you train that became rookie of the year? How many, how many, what, the sales or? Yeah, sales agents. Uh, oh, 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 the number of sales agents that I have mentored to become rookie of the year. Yeah. Uh, for the, the specific rookie of the year award, it's, it's eight, but there's hundreds more that have won office awards and other board of board awards. And, you know, I've literally retained hundreds, thousands of agents to get through the exam the first time. So it's something I enjoy doing. I, I really appreciate being here tonight. I've been in the business now, guys, about 42 or three years, started teaching real estate classes in 1980. And, uh, uh, I'm really proud to be here uh, working with, with, with the Institute of Real Estate Education. We were talking a little bit before we began the Zoom call about how this particular school has such a phenomenal reputation for getting people through the test the first time, but not only that, but keeping all the information timely and uh, updated. And, and some schools just don't spend that amount of time and money to do that. I mean, these are pre-recorded classes. You could use the same class for years without updating. Now, it won't help you guys get through the exam, particularly when you were taught the answer was $150, and really it's $250. But, you know, you'll probably pass anyway, maybe, they hope. But uh, Dan doesn't do that. I mean, if there, he is right on top of it. If there's a law change or a rule change, he's constantly monitoring or attending the commissioner meetings, and he knows what's going on. And, and we keep our information updated. Okay, tonight's topic is uh, real property characteristics. And uh, this is a very important part of the test. And it's because it, it, it gets into a lot of the details that we're talking about. And so uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with a short quiz. So let's, let's go ahead and get that quiz up, Dan, and let's just jump right into the questions. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Now, what we're talking about here is, uh, number one, a lease is which of the following. Now, a lease is that personal property, real property, an easement, or is it permanent? Well, a lease is a personal property right that someone has uh, asked for uh, and they've signed agreements in order to have, and it gives someone the right to use a property and, and for a lot of different things. Um, so it, leases are a contract that are signed by both parties. It's not real property because a transfer of real property, we use something, a document, you know, one of the transferring documents, a document called a deed. It, a lease is personal property. Okay. But there are rights to a lease. Okay. Um, an easement is not a lease. An easement actually is, uh, someone's right to use a property. Um, without really having possession of it. You know, you can't camp out on it, you can't live on it, but you can like it. The best example is a, 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 an easement for ingress and egress and into a property. But uh, a lease agreement normally is, is a situation where if, if you're thinking about residential, it's where someone lives, you know, so that's not an easement. That's just a right to use, not the right to, to do it. And of course, none of these agreements are permanent. Okay, so... Hope that wasn't too hard for you. Kind of ease our way into tonight. Let's look at the next question, Dan. Okay, a property. Uh, okay, the the pictures are obscuring what I'm supposed to be reading here uh, on my screen. I don't know if I can move that over. Ah, but Dan can. Okay, a property has a, uh, has a large lake on one side, a small stream, and to the lake that forms on the other side of the property. And we want to know which is true. Okay. Um, the lakefront is governed by riparian rights. The stream is governed by littoral rights. The lake and the stream together are governed by littoral rights. C, the lake and the stream together are governed by riparian rights. And D, the lake is governed by littoral rights and the stream is governed by riparian rights. Okay, so B and C are similar but different, right? They're similar in that they're taking these two different concepts and they're, they're trying to apply one definition to it. That's usually wrong. Uh, so in this case, 
which do you guys think it is? How many think it's A and how many think it's D if you eliminate B and C? It's what D. Is, okay, um, we have one person for D. Any other votes? Okay, drum roll. And the answer is Dan. Here we go. Get your vote in, write it down. It is D. Now, uh, large bodies of water like lakes, you know, and I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm Bear Lake's pretty dang big, but you know, we're really talking like Lake Erie or Lake Michigan, that kind of thing. They're governed by littoral rights, but a stream is riparian rights. So any moving water, like a river or stream is riparian. And that guys, that's just knowing the definitions. You either know them or you don't. You know, sometimes you can luck out and eliminate those two. You figured it was A or D, you had a 50-50 chance and you guess right, that's cool. <laughs> you chose well. But it's very important that you spend quality time with the definitions, because if you don't have them, you, you, you know, you're just guessing. So you need to know the definitions of things. Let's go to number three. Okay, when an easement transfers with the per uh, when an easement transfers with the purchase of a property, it's known as a what? Well, a trade fixture. Well, a trade fixture is like a barber chair or maybe your dentist chair or x-ray equipment. It's something that's used in a trade or business that is always personal property of the tenant. Well, that's not it. A pertinence. Mm, that sounds good. Implement. Implement are uh, crops that are grown in the year of uh, uh, you know, in, in any calendar or season year, like um, if you had cherry orchard, the, the trees would be real property, but the cherries on the tree would be implements. And a monument is something we use, of course, for uh, land surveys and, and prop in uh, legal descriptions. The monument is, is uh, usually it's, it's a peg in the ground that, you know, helps you get from one thing to another. So out of all those guys, it's got to be what? We've got to be B, right? Yeah, very good. Thank you. This is not a trade fixture. It's not a dental chair. <laughs> it's not an implement. It's not cherries. And it's not a peg in the ground. So, you know, once again, it's knowing your definitions. But you can see that all these definitions are things that have to do with real property characteristics. Let's move on to number four. An implement. Oops, I gave this one away, didn't I? Okay, an implement is uh, what? I gave the definition a moment ago. It's not a... It's personal deep. property. Property, very good. Personal property, uh, such as plants or crops. Okay. Um, now, implements are something that can sneak up and bite you. You got to be really, really careful if you're selling land, particularly agricultural land. Uh, unless you're doing a lot of it, there's a lot of different things that you need to be concerned about. Water rights are a huge issue, and implements are another issue as well. If you had a 20-acre cherry orchard, who do you think the best buyer for that would be? Would it be a, would it be a, a farmer? Maybe, but probably the best buyer for twenty orchard is is a home builder, who wants to Mine. buy, who wants to buy that parcel and uh, tear down the trees and put houses on it. And the the problem you have is this problem with implements, <sighs> because if you do not address the implements by sale agreement in your rep C contract. Uh, then it, it could be a problem because the developer wants to get going right away, buys the property, but the crops haven't matured or been harvested yet. So uh, because of the laws in our state governing, governing implements, we protect agriculture here. You know, that former seller who sold his property prior to the harvest, the buyer's going to, you know, in order to, to go in there and start pushing those trees down, the buyer's going to have to wait till that current year crop has been taken out. And maybe cherries isn't that big a deal because you know when they're going to come, come ripe and they're going to be harvested. But what about alfalfa? You know, it could be three or four cuttings. It could really push that, <clears throat> it could really push that developer back uh, significantly in his plans to get a, <clears throat> excuse me, to get a D5 caterpillar in there and knock those trees down or whatever, you know, move that alfalfa out of the way. Let's go to number five. Yeah, number five says an encumbrance. Now an encumbrance is anything that burdens the title to property. You know, it could be non-financial like the easement we talked about earlier or the first thing here. Um, <clears throat> but an encumbrance on a property that affects how the property is used would be what? 
Easement, license, partition, or remainder? Partition. Okay, I like partition, but you know, partition, parting in there. Okay, an encumbrance on a property that affects how the property is used is a what? Probably an, an easement. easement. Yeah, because an easement is a right to use, isn't it? Right? A license agreement is a very temporary thing. Uh, this time of year, you know, you know, we, we went through July and we saw fireworks stands going up in, uh, you know, like uh, uh, parking lots of, of uh, grocery stores and whatnot. And savvy grocery store or mall operators never give that fireworks stand a lease. They give them a license agreement. Any temporary vendor is probably there on a license agreement. Why? Because license agreements are very easily canceled. If that, if, you know, if the guy running a fireworks stand says, yeah, I only have a stand, it's only, you know, 10 by 16, but then, you know, the uh, property owner shows up and it's not just the stand, there's three semi-truck trailers out there full of product and stuff. And, you know, he's you taking up half the parking lot. If you've given that vendor a lease, it's going to be hard to get rid of them. If you've given them a license agreement, it gets canceled. You know, a, a ticket to a movie or an event is a license agreement to sit in that chair. But if you're obnoxious and whatnot, they can cancel that agreement and kick you the heck out. But you can't do that with a lease. It's very difficult. So what do we got here? And what is our answer? The answer, drum roll, is an easement. It's not a remainder. <clears throat> remainder is probably something and more along the lines of a life estate, that type of thing. It's not probably the best distractor here, but it's there. Partition has parting in it. And we already, you know, nauseatingly described a license. So let's go with six. Okay, man, you're still cutting off here, the, the, the thing, Dan. I mean, can't see him very well. A property, property A has an easement. Oh, perfect. Property has an easement over property B, which allows them access to a waterway, which is true. Okay, man, it'd be a real bummer if you had a property near the lake, but not on the lake, but you want to be able to get to the lake. But the only way you get to the lake is you have an easement. So property A has an easement over property B. Who owns the easement? Who has the right to use it? A, property A has an easement over property B. Okay, so property A is the dominant tenement and property B is a subservient tenement. Okay, but what is true? Property B is a, the tenement appurtenant. Mm, property A is the, property B is a tenement term, but property A is a tenement appurtenant. Property B is a dominant tenement. Are they the one benefiting or are they the ones being uh, um, disadvantaged somewhat because people can go across your property? You know, property A is a dominant tenement. The one that benefits is dominant. The one that doesn't benefit, of course, is uh, subservient. So B is obviously not the dominant. Number seven. Questions about any of these guys, just speak up, you know, and we'll talk about them in more detail. Some of these are pretty much definitional. Okay, in which circumstances might an owner be granted an easement by prescription? Now, an easement by prescription is where <clears throat> you've been using a property for a number of years. There are rules involved like you have to have no degree of consent from the true owner, okay? Um, and it has to be for a long period of time. Utah, it's like 21 years. Um, and, uh, and, and it's very clear that you're using it and whatnot. Uh, so neighborhood, the neighboring property owner gives a permission to pick trees, uh, to, to pick something, oh, to pick something from your trees five years in a row. Well, okay, that has nothing to do with an easement by prescription because they actually have permission. Okay, easement by per, uh, prescription is only given when it's hostile to the true owner. In other words, there's no degree of consent. The driveway payment encroaches on a neighbor's property and goes uncontested for a period of time. Well, kind of warm and fuzzy. We hang on to that for a minute. See, the owner sells to uh, sell the owner sells to property a new owner within five years of purchase. Okay, the owner sells probably the property to a new owner within five years, but that has nothing to do with anything. A tenant remains in the property without paying rent for five years. Well, that's 
call being a real crappy landlord. <laughs> but that's not going to give the tenant ownership rights, is it? Why? Because there was an agreement. There was an agreement to rent the property. The tenant's just defaulting. I mean, he's just not doing it correctly. But So out of all those, what do we got? That leaves us with... B as in boy. Yep. B as in boy, the driveway payment encroaches on neighbor's property, goes uncontested for a certain amount of time. And that's a long time in Utah. Okay. Now I have a question on that. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah, please do. So, um, okay, this is a personal thing. So my home has kind of, the neighbors have just kind of chosen to use it as kind of a thoroughfare to get to the <laughs> subdivision behind me. Okay. Um, and it, and we've never said anything. And now we're thinking about buying or selling our home. Yeah. How long has it been? Oh, for us, it's been 17 years. So almost that 20, but not. Quite. Yeah. Yeah. You're getting, we, you're getting way, way into uh, turbulent waters here. Okay. <clears throat> I'll tell you what BYU does. Okay. BYU has all their private streets that go, you know, hither and skither all over campus. Brigham Young University shuts the campus down between Christmas and New Year's every day. They lock it down. So they've d d they have denied continuous access. Now, understand that your neighbor only goes back and forth in that subdivision when they want to go. But if you ever lock it down to where they can't get back there, even if it's only for a week or whatever, and you document that, you hold up a calendar or you hold up, you know, probably a newspaper or something and you have photos showing it locked off and then you repeatedly can document how long it was locked off, even if it's only for a period of time, a short period of time, because they have to have continuous access. Now, um, that doesn't mean they have to use it every day. It just means that that has been un unobstructed. Okay. Yeah. So, so if we, um, oh, what was my question? So if I was to put a gate up now, I'm still under that 20 years and they can test, do they have to, they have to contest it, obviously. Well, they don't have to. I mean, the, the, you're, you're, not, you're the one proving up, you maintaining your rights. You know, if, if they say, well, we almost made it, <laughs> that's not going to cut it. Okay. The, the way they would cure this, the way that they would get their easement by prescription is they would go to court and it would be a quiet <laughs> and it would, judge and it would prove to the judge that, well, we use this property whenever we wanted to use it. You know, and, they, they would, and we've done it for 21 years and they would sit down and we had no degree of consent with the true owner and whatever else. So we want you to grant us an easement by prescription by court order. Okay. So you would get up, it's your turn to get up and speak now. And you say, well, you know, the fact that they had continuous access for all this time, your honor is not true because in year 18, 19, 20 and 21, you know, we locked the property down for a week in each one of those periods of years. And uh, so they didn't have continuous access. Thus we maintain, just like BYU, hopefully you get a judge who graduated from BYU. <laughs> okay. we, we, we maintained our property rights. Okay. Now, another way of doing that, a different way, is, is to go to the uh, neighbor and say, you know, we understand you've been using and um, so we think we ought to formalize this deal. So we've gone ahead and written the license agreements where you can come through this property. And uh, all you have to do is give us like 20 bucks and everything's fine, you know? And if, they're dumb like enough, yeah, and if they're dumb enough to sign that, well, then there was a degree of consent. They go to court, they try to get it eased by prescription. You show the agreement to the judge, your honor, we actually had an agreement with them. I mean, it wasn't a lot of money, but we had an agreement that they could go ahead and use that for $20 in perpetuity, you know? So it, 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 it kills their argument for easement by prescription. So prior to selling it, do I need to, I, we just put a gate up and just sell it that way. It doesn't need to be told to the new owners or the buyers that that's the situation. I would definitely document, <coughs> Here, here's the problem. There's a, con there's a concept under these types of things called tacking, T-A-C-K-I-N-G. It's on the test every once in a while. Yeah. But tacking is using their period of usage plus you're tacking on to a former user or a former user. And if they can all come to court and document 21 years, then your, your goose is cooked somewhat. So the sooner you start locking that off, the better off you're going to be. Um, and if no other thing happens, it, you know, you might be called into court someday for your buyer who bought the property. 
and they say, you need to help us prove that this wasn't uh, continuous for the 21 years. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Eight, number eight, sir. Bring it up. If multiple lien holders have liens against the same property, how are they prioritized? Well, guys, first to record is first and right. It's not alphabetical. Give me a break. <laughs> Mortgage and mechanics and rela yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, those are all called liens. A, an encumbrance, uh, financial encumbrance that has to do with money is called a lien. Uh, by the amount of money owed, for heaven's sakes, of course not. It's by D, the order they are recorded. Pretty, pretty simple. Question number nine. Property owner takes out a mortgage on their property after several years, they fall on hard times, Ugh. fail to make the payments. The lender forecloses on the property, but the owner has an opportunity to reclaim full ownership rights by paying all the monies back, you know, plus the interest and the foreclosure cost. That's called the equitable uh, of, of redemption period. The equity of redemption period. It's also sometimes called the equitable period of redemption. Depends on the state you're in, but both means the same thing. What's the word escheat mean? It's when the state, see the S in there, E-S? It's when the state cheats you out of it. You see the S for state and then cheat? What that means is someone died in test state. They died without a will. You know, they should have died and left their estate to BYU law school, right? <laughs> Since we're kind of picking on them tonight. Um, that would have been nice, but they didn't. And they died without a will and no heirs can be found. Ownerless property doesn't benefit anyone. So we have state laws that allow the state to jump in and just cheat those properties. And then they usually sell them and the money goes in the state school fund. Uh, it takes about seven years to uh, qualify for is cheat. And in Utah, of course, if the taxes aren't being paid, it's probably gonna go to tax sale before it gets to this. Not a lot of real estate is, is, is cheated. Some might but it's weird. Uh, more often than not, things are as cheated are things like inactive bank accounts, brokerage accounts, uh, money is but put on deposit with the utility companies that nobody ever came back and reclaimed their deposit, that sort of thing. Let's look at the next thing, Dan, number 10. Laws that restrict the way private owners use their property are laws that restrict. Are they assessments, zoning laws? Hmm. Restricted to commercial real estate? Mm, no, not really. Uh, limited to federal, but not state laws. <laughs> okay. That's kind of a gobbledygook uh, distractor that, you know, not even a very good one. What do you think, guys? Is it an assessment or is it zoning laws? Well, assessment mm -hmm. has to do with your taxation, but it really doesn't have much to do with how it's used. You see that? Mm -hmm. That's the stem of that question. Now, guys, read the questions twice before you jump to the answers. You know, use, use, use. Okay, then you look at the answers. Well, assessment sounds really good, but whoa, whoa no, 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 that's not use. Zoning law affects the use, right? Mm -hmm. You can do this, you can't do that. Correct answer is B. Number 11. If a property conforms with the zoning laws when it's built, but then the laws changed, okay? the properties no longer conforms, it's called a, what do you think guys? What would be fair? You've had a pig farm here for many years. It was zoned agricultural. Time passes on, the hours of the so hourglass sift down to the bottom and now everything's a subdivision around you uh, because it got rezoned for maybe low or high density residential, whatever it is. But is that fair to you? Because you've been there well before those laws were ever changed. So it's not a buffer zone. Buffer zone is really good land planning where uh, someone actually, uh, you know, you don't put um, uh, smelly petroleum distillation plants right next to residential. You know, you want a buffer zone where there's a, a, there's a period of di a difference in there. Uh, zoning relic, <laughs> that's not even something. Okay, pre-existing non-conforming use, that one feels really warm and fuzzy. Gross lease, gross lease is a lease that the money the landlord gets is gross and the landlord has to pay the expenses out of that. Um, you know, a good example of a gross lease is probably residential property. Next. 
pre-existing use, which is only being nice, right? I mean, now, 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 let's make this, this clear, okay? So your barn burns down at the pig farm, are they going to let you get a building permit to rebuild it? What do you think? No. No. Now, eventually, they're going to force out the pigs, <laughs> you know, but they're going to do it kind of reasonably. What about, I want to build a bigger barn, and you go down to get a permit. What do you think? No. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. You're currently zone residential. Yeah, but I was here before, and as long as you maintain what you've got going. All right, so you take the pigs out for a year or two because, you know, you got tired of messing with it, and now you want to reopen. What do you think? No. So, you know, they're going to try to pull you into conformance, but they're going to be semi-nice about it. Number 12, when a local municipality may, uh, takes ownership of a piece of property from a private citizen through the power of eminent domain. Okay, eminent domain is the right of the government to come in and take property and use it for the public good, okay? It's not as cheat. You know, that's when someone died intestate, meaning without a will, correct? It's not zoning. Zoning is not taking, okay? This is taking, okay? It takes ownership, okay? Zoning is just telling you what you can do with it. Our, we have a constitution in this country, okay? And the constitution clearly states that you could be secure in your assets and your personal effects and your property and whatnot. The government can't come in and take your property without giving you proper and correct compensation for it, okay? and we're protected, that's a constitutional right. You know, so, um, but they gotta pay you for it. But if they just tell you what to do with it, the zoning, they don't have to pay you for that, okay? There were a number of years ago, you know, before we had the Olympics and uh, when the Olympics got announced, that boy, that was a great party. I hope you were there, but it got announced, it was fun. Uh, it was great, we're gonna do the Olympics, this is cool. And of course, uh, buyers, of different types of properties were already in town. They, they figured we'd get it. So they got it and they started running around buying everything and lay their hands on it they thought it would be valuable because, it, because there's a ramp up to the Olympics, of course, and they wanted to get in and get it now and then resell it later when, it's, when the Olympics are, are nigh, you know, right here, right now. So uh, some investors went in and bought some of that meadow land out by uh, Kimball Junction, Park City, which was zoned for commercial and they paid some good money for it but uh, as time went on they re really downzoted that they downzoned that into a much less higher use it wasn't zoned commercial anymore they'd spent millions of dollars for that property but, <laughs> but do you think that they were able to recoup anything from summit county who changed the zoning oh heavens no <laughs> you know they were just out so zoning can be real Beneficial. It can make your property worth a lot of money or it can make your property worthless, at least for what they wanted to do with it. So that's zoning. That's not taking a property. That's just telling you what you can do with it. And you're not protected by the Constitution uh, that they had to pay you for that. As assessment or condemnation. Okay. The uh, assessment, of course, is uh, we have a whole department for that in every county. They're called the county assessors, and they're the ones that go out and determine what properties are worth for property taxation purposes. No, it's condemnation. The process of using the power of eminent domain is a process called condemnation. Now, a lot of you think, well, you know, the property was condemned. You think it's the health department running out there and throwing a skull and crossbone sign on the property and saying, you know, full of mold or methamphetamine, stay out, that kind of thing. And that can happen, but that's not on the test. When you see the word condemnation on the test, it is the process of the government uh, empowering their eminent domain. Number 13, deed restrictions. Okay, now, public restrictions are like zoning, right? But a deed restriction is a private restriction. It's private legal actions against neighbor properties, mm, used to enforce demographic restrictions, eh, used to limit private use of property. Hmm and renegotiated at every closing. <laughs> no, no, okay. Guys, it's C, use to limit private use of property. A deed restriction is a private restriction. Okay, earlier today, uh, we were talking about a um, uh, property in Bluffdale that my son just got under contract that 
I helped him get it under contract that is right next to the old Maverick. Now, you know, on Redwood Road, which in that area is actually called, well, anyway, it's, it's Redwood Road, but it's in that area. There was an old Maverick there at 120 something south, maybe 126. Um, anyway, that was torn down when the new Maverick came in and built one closer to Bangor Highway. Well, they didn't want another convenience store there. They didn't want people even tempted to think about another convenience store so close to their new Maverick. So they tore the building down. But they're also going to put a deed restriction that you can never build another convenience store on that site. Why would they, you know, when they control that property and someone wants to come in and buy it. Now, if you want to buy it, put up a medical building, no problem. You want to buy it and put up a, you know, some other type of commercial property there, a car wash, I don't know, you know, whatever you can get away with with zoning. But nothing that would compete with the convenience store or sell gasoline. They're not going to allow that. And that would be a private deed restriction. It just makes sense. Number 14. Guys, we need some more questions. I know there's burning issues. <laughs> okay. All right. A survey says the property is 100 feet wide, but the broker paced it off and he's pretty accurate. You know, I mean, he's a big hunter. You know, he's, he knows what 300 yards is, and but he paced it off, and he estimated it can't be any more than 90 feet. What should should his advertisement say about that property? Uh, man, I'm going with the survey. Okay, some engineer took his laser equipment out there and said it's 100 feet. You know, I don't care how accurate I think I am. I'm going with 100 feet. Wouldn't you? And even if it's wrong, I mean, what can you back it up with? Say. The survey. <laughs> yeah, I got a survey. It said there's 100 feet there, guys. You know, just because you paste it off, well, what? I don't know. Why doesn't have anything? I don't know. Whatever. Guys, it's, it's the survey, right? No problem there. The edge of the property that is, that is adjacent to the street. Okay, so we're talking about, you know, maybe it's a rectangular property, but... but just one fourth of it is on the street. It's the street side of the property. That's called the front foot. It's just a definitional thing. It's called the front foot because it's, it's the frontage on the road. So if you had an 80 foot front footage, that, that's what it would be. It'd be 80 foot on that dimension. Okay. Uh, you know, it can be real important in certain types of properties, particularly, you know, I mean, no more from if you have. Uh, particularly in a commercial type use, you know, the, probably the better off you're going to be. It's just more visibility for your property and everything else. You know, corner property might even be better than, than one that's kind of inbound in a, in a street just because of ingress and ingress. But the front footage is the footage on the street. And why is that important? Well, because sometimes property sold that way. It's sold by so many dollars per front foot. Not so much anymore, but hey, on the test, you know, they may have a question about, you know, property sold for this much, how much was that, you know, was the, here are the dimensions, you know, how much is that per front foot? You thought that was a math question. <laughs> yeah, I don't care if it asks numbers, and it was just a definitional question. Go to 16. The homeowner's property taxes have increased, and after reviewing this year's assessment and comparing it to last year's assessment, they find their property is going to assess a higher value this year over last. What would be the best way to show the municipality that their property assessment was in error and that they actually should be assessed at a lower rate? What do you think would be best? Which one of these would work? Well, you're, I'll show my mortgage balance. What does that have to do with anything? You know, in a perfect world, you're going to own that property. There would be no loan balance, okay? Uh, prove that similar properties in the municipality receive lower assessments. Hmm, I kind of like that one. If we're going out and finding properties that are like ours, and they have smaller assessments, okay? She showed that no improvement's been made since the last assessment. Well, your property doesn't have to be improved to increase in value. A lot of things just happen because they go up in value, and they're, you haven't changed anything. So that won't help. Prove that similar properties are selling in the current economic crisis. Well, the assessor doesn't care if they're selling or not. They only care with what they're worth. If the fact that they're not selling may uh, in some way um, influence the value, all right, they may go with that, but uh, that's a stretch. 
What do you think, guys? It's got to be similar properties have received lower assessments. Pretty tough to do these days because properties have been marching onward, up and up and upward, you know, with, with hardly a misstep. So it's going to be hard to show that uh, your property is not worth what the assessor says and you're going to have to pay more taxes on it. A uh, question on that one, though. How would you how would you get that information? You're going to go around and ask your neighbors, how was your assessment? You're going to like go door record. to door? It's all in the public record what similar properties have assessed for. It's public record. Okay. Uh, um, but I've done a lot of these. You know, there was one year we did 550 of these, but it was a it was a year when properties had tubed in value. And um, you know, we lost every one of them. They didn't they didn't move a bit a, a budge. They didn't budge an inch. Okay, it was pretty upsetting. But the next year we came back. And uh, since we took three weeks of their time in hearings, <laughs> even though we lost every hearing, we took three weeks in their time in hearings. So we came back the next year with about 125 properties and they gave us every, every, every one of them because they didn't want us hanging around that long. You know, it's kind of political. Just one more quick question. Does Utah have a, a cap on the assessment value that can happen on an annual basis? Like no uh, more than 3% or 4 uh, or whatever? You're, you're, have you moved here from California? <laughs> uh, maybe, yeah. yeah. Yeah, a lot of states are like that, but Utah doesn't have that. I mean, you know, we're relatively, you know, we don't have, you know, as many peaks and valleys. Now, it, sure, the last few years, we've, we've seen 5 10% in a lot of properties and Maybe we should look at something like that, but you know our legislature is pretty slow to do that. Um, you know, it's uh, a lot of our money in Utah comes from gasoline taxes, which has got the legislators really upset and concerned because people aren't driving as much. You know, so you know they haven't been collecting what they forecasted, so now they're casting about looking for more revenue sources. But we do get a substantial amount of money from property tax as well. There is a little bit of um, there's a little bit of negotiation with the state tax office. A lot of times, people think, "Oh, the tax office, what they say goes," but when in reality, it's a lot of normal people doing a normal job. And so, like my own property, when it assessed a lot higher than I thought it should, I did I just did a market analysis based on you know properties that were around and the information I had available for homes for sale. And I came back to him and said, I think my pro, and usually you want to say my property is worth a lot of money. But in this case, I wanted to say, you know, my property is not worth as much as you say it is because I don't want to get that many taxes. So, uh, so they actually came back and, and met me in the middle. They said, we said it was this, you said it was down here. How about we call it here in the middle? And so we negotiated with them and came to something that we agreed on. And so all uh, of that. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you, Dan. If you want to say some more, go ahead. I know, just, uh, just be aware that a lot of times you can negotiate things that maybe you didn't yeah. think you could. But the key to that is what Dan said, and that is you have to have evidence. And the evidence you bring in are comparable sales or other properties that are assessed lower. You know, they, they want evidence. They want proof. You can't just take your word for it. Uh, you know, it's best to go in there with an appraisal. Of course, we went in with an appraisal, too, but we, we just – they just – weren't hearing us. They were giving us no love, but the second year they gave us all the love because <laughs> they didn't want to take it up all their time. But then they bumped right back up again, you know, so it, you know, but please understand that large property owners in our state, particularly on the commercial side, now um, they, they have staffs that do this. They hire appraisers that come in and work for them only. And these appraisers, you know, because if you own millions and millions of dollars of real estate all over, like your utility company or somebody like that, or any large property owner, uh, you're in fighting every year. I mean, and you bring in the pros and they bring in their assessors and you argue back and forth and you may, maybe you cut in the middle, but the savings can be hundreds of thousands of dollars in property taxes. It'd be better if they just declared themselves a church, you know, then they wouldn't have to pay any at all. Go, what's the next one, Dan? Um, can I ask a question? The Church of Electric. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, um, so if you had recently had a, an appraisal, then can you show the appraisal? To Absolutely. Or? Yeah, they want to see the evidence. Sure. Okay. Oh, good. Thank you. But it better be a decent appraisal and it better have good comps and it better 
be timely. It can't be three years old. You know, they're going to say, well, that's old. And we're going we're, you know, to throw that out. Dan went in with the competitive market analysis, which is not a full blown appraisal, but it did have properties in it that had recently sold, you know, within the last six months to a year or so. And, and uh, that's great evidence. That's what you need. That's one of the, you know, I did it because I want to endear myself to property owners. You know, I had 500 property owners that paid 50 bucks for me to go do that. It wasn't worth my time, except that I sold a number of houses for them. Okay. And made a lot of friends, you know, and so the first year says, well, I guess we're properly assessed. So I took a swack out the second year and we got them all lowered. And then the third year they came back and bumped them all up again anyway. So, <laughs> but it sure got talked to a lot of homeowners. Okay, so it worked out because I got listings and sales. Thank you. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. And number 17. Property tax amounts uh, for individual properties are determined by, I don't know, real estate broker opinion, uh, appraisal, no, assessment, mm, that sounds good. Comparative market analysis. Well, Dan used a comparative market analysis, a CMA. But normally, you know, property taxes for individual properties are determined by the assessor's office. So which one do you think is right? Probably one that sounds a whole lot like assessor, like assessment, and there it is. And the answer is C. But it's a lot like a comparative market analysis. I mean, these guys go to special schools. They get special certifications. Some of them are licensed appraisers, but they don't have to be but they went through appraisal schools, got an appraisal license, they've had a lot of experience. So they're not just pulling things out of air, but on the other hand, they can make mistakes. And uh, where we did have success was where they miscategorized the property. They said it was a two story, it actually was a, a bi-level. You know, two stories are worth more than bi-levels. You know, so when we found a mistake they'd actually made, you know, they were much more willing to, you know, uh, go with our values and correct all the mistakes. Okay, other questions you guys may have. This is your chance. Come on, guys. About any topic, any, to any topic at all, any of the other topics or getting started in real estate or whatever you want to talk about. I do, I do have a question about easements. So okay, Bob, um, this, is, this is more along the lines of probably a, an easement of necessity, but my folks have a cabin in Bear Lake and we've had it there for you know, about 32 years and um, the property behind the cabin actually has a, actually has a, uh, um, it actually has a, a, what am I trying to think of? It has a, there's a creek that flows behind the property and, and actually that runs right through the middle of that property is, uh, is an irrigation. And it actually flows through the middle of that property and down through the rest of the cabins amongst it. Now, right? Yeah. So my, my question is, it's been doing that for, you know, ever since we've had a cabin there. So is there, is there any chance or any, any reason that anyone could ever build on that property? Um, okay. The, the proper way to proceed on that is to get, uh, a title report or have someone pull all the title records for that property and it will tell you what is recorded against the property okay now that's not the be all and end all because some of these properties are quite old and have been used for a long period of time but at least it will tell you whether there was an irrigation company that actually acquired a right uh, you know like an easement for irrigation purposes or whatever if it's anything like that, something that's already been recorded and whatnot, you're probably pretty much going to have to live with that. And that, if that would pre preclude you from building on that piece of ground, and well, that's, that's the way it is. If, uh, <clears throat> on the other hand, nothing's been adjudicated or recorded against that property, it doesn't mean that someone couldn't probably uh, jump in and try to do an easement by prescription. Um, you know, judges are trying to be real reasonable about things. If you had uh, no evidence that there was any uh, adjudicated or recorded right against that property and you started to do improvements and stuff on it and then someone came up and started complaining about it you know if it's things like fencing and road or something like that or parking or putting in a, a septic tank uh, 
things that could be worked around. Uh, they may go ahead and give some rights to the other person, but if you built some pretty serious property on there, um, you know, that they're generally, they don't like you to tear down buildings because someone didn't enforce their rights for prescriptive easement or whatever. But these, these are great questions. I will guarantee you that we'll not be that detailed on a real estate exam, but I appreciate your, your practical question. And um, the, the real answer to your question is do some investigation on what's currently against that property and then get some legal opinions, you know, yeah, on, I mean, we're, on what we're the right. Gonna, we're grateful that it's there because we, we, we don't want anybody to build there to obstruct sure. our view. Yeah. And, and I would think the only way somebody could pull that off as if they actually put plumbing into the into the you know actually put plumbing into the system in, in order to uh make yeah because i think it's what actually feeds everyone's lawns and everything else all the way down to right the, the lake well someone could tunnel under that though you know i mean there's a lot of things that could happen there yeah. so you know you just have to you just have to do some research get find out but you start by finding out what's currently recorded against the property and then kind of go from there Thank you. Yeah, but you know, it would be nice to maintain your little piece of heaven out there. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone wants to be the last one in. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's Bear Lake. Nice, nice place. Nice place to have a little run to. Super. Okay. Um, let me give you some practical tips. Um, there's things that you can do right now while you're in real estate school to get ready for the real estate business. Okay. Uh, one of the, th the most important is start putting together a list. Now, when I say a list, I want the name, address, phone number, uh, you know, that type of e e emails. I want that type of information. Now, these, this could be your friends and family. If someone recently got married uh, or had a baby shower or something like that, find out who the organizer was and get their list <laughs> and add it to your own. Uh, that's going to save you a lot of work. Um, but Here's, here's the thing, okay? Uh, you, you need to hit the bricks running. And the best way to hit the bricks running, gang, is to uh, ha have someone ready to do business with you. Now, please, I'm not suggesting that you solicit business prior to be licensed. That's, that's against the law in our state. But you can prepare a list of friends, relatives, and you know, other people that would be in your sphere of influence, people you've done business with before and other, other professions. Now, you think this would be a no-brainer activity, and most agents do this, but I'm here to tell you after working in this business for over 43 years, 42 years, and uh, mentoring many, many agents in this business and a lot to award-winning status, agents don't do it. That's stupid. These are the people that will support you in the beginning. They love you. My first sale in this business was to my brother-in-law. First day I was licensed, he was in my car. <laughs> we didn't find a property that day, but we found one the next day and we put it under contract and he was so happy. Well, he's the only guy I knew in town. I said, well, Stephen, who else do you know? He said, well, there's this guy I met. He said, he's, he was talking about selling, you know. Well, let's get him on the phone. Got him on the phone, went over there that night, got a listing. First listing, first sale, first week. Thank you, Stephen. Stephen was my brother-in-law. He loved me. Still does, even though his wife doesn't, my, you know, his sister doesn't anymore. But anyway, <clears throat> enough on that topic. But anyway, the point is, folks, get your list together. And now, don't start marketing to them and asking for business until you have a license. However, <clears throat> a lot of these people are probably in your Facebook account if you have one. You could post on Facebook tomorrow, says, hey, I went to a live broadcast from the Institute of Real Estate and I learned this about easements, or I learned this about, um, you know, anything we've talked about tonight, you know, it, without saying, hey, and when I get my license, I want you to do business with me, because that's, no, 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 don't do that. But you can share experiences. Hey, I learned today in real estate school that in Utah, you can own property as a tenant in common, a joint tenant, or tenancy by its entireties. Now, most people know about the first two, but I had no idea the third one even existed. But really what that is, is joint tenancy for married people, which is what most people think they have, but they really don't. Because in tenancy by entirety, what happens with that is that one marriage partner can't sell their interest in the property without the permission of the other marriage partner. But you don't have tenancy by entirety. You probably have joint tenancy. So could your spouse sell her half interest 
to someone else without your permission. <laughs> you think, oh no, heavens no. Now granted, it won't do much for the marriage, folks, but you know, that could happen. So you think you have tenancy by entirety, but I bet you don't. I bet you have joint tenancy. That's something I learned in real estate school today. Now, did I ask for business? No, I just shared an experience of what I'm currently doing, which, you know, I'm learning all about real estate. That's it. You know, they can draw their own conclusions, but the day you have your license, your, your narrative changes, doesn't it? Hey, I got a license. Cool. Now I can ask you for business. But in the interim, you're starting to change your identity. And uh, there's two things you got to do with all these people on your list. One is to change your identity and the other is prove performance. You know, a lot of people will do business with you just because they find out you got a license and they love you. You know, I mean, Stephen did. Thank you, Stephen. But a lot of people won't recommend you to someone else until they actually know you're, you're actually doing it. You know, they're not going to recommend you to their boss who's getting divorced and needs help uh, when you don't prove to them that you're acting. Because they all know someone that got into real estate and got right back out and didn't, didn't work for them. So it's important to do those two campaigns. Proof of performance is important. And you do that by just sending them cards. I'm selling this house. And if anyone knows anyone who wants to buy it, that's great. Then that one goes under contract. Well, that one's gone. Now I'm working on this one. You know, a few of those and they figure you're a hitter and you're actually doing things, even though they really weren't your listings, but you know, they were company listings and you worked on it together or something, whatever. But just um, do that. If you do that, then you'll have an easier go getting started because uh, you know, people that already love you and know you know that you're a good person, know that you're thorough, know that you now if you're a screw up, obviously this isn't gonna work, but <laughs> you know, but change your life and don't be a screw up anymore. Well, appreciate the opportunity being here, Dan. Do you have any closing remarks you'd like to say? I just want to say thanks everyone for being here. Uh, it's really great to be able to talk with you one on one sometimes. I know with the online classes it feels a little passive, but uh, but we are here. We can answer your questions by phone or email anytime. Um, Rick has been uh, so great to have here and to share his expertise. Oh, thanks for the We're so thrilled to have him. And we, uh, you know, we, uh, we do these every other Tuesday. So if you have questions on a topic between now and then, you know, you're welcome to call our helpline at the school and get some help that way. Talk to an instructor. Uh, and, and, but you can also come back to this one every other Tuesday and, and bring those questions with you. And we're happy to answer them. You know, we're committed to your success here, not just getting through the exam, but actually doing something in the business you can be proud of. My motto is bless lives, make money. You can do both in real estate. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you being here. Thanks, Dan. Hey, one more question. Yes, please. So I was just going to say with the, the, the biweekly meetings, is it the same uh, conference line? Same, same hyperlink and same time generally? Yeah, same, same link, six o'clock every other Tuesday. Different topic. Okay. Great, thank you. But any topic's fine. Bring, bring your questions, okay? Another question. Um, so what's the best way of studying? Is it like each chapter has um, some quizzes and tests and are those the best ways of um, studying for the exam or like, I don't know. <laughs> Obviously I haven't finished. What type right. of learner are you doing? Are you a visual learner, an audio learner, or? I'm a visual learner. You're a visual learner. So you like to watch the videos a lot, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> um, the, everyone has a preferred learning style. Some people, they, they like to hear it. Other people like to see it. And, uh, but, you know, figure out what your learning style is and then study that way. I mean, if you study better by, uh, you know, watching, uh, then, or you study better just by listening, or you study better by, you know, reading, um, you know, that would be good. But I, I do recommend that you work real hard on the, on the vocab. You know, you need to know what you're talking about. Unfortunately, <clears throat> there's over four to 500 terms that are very key to the exam, and a lot of them are not used. You know, you don't use the word hypothecate in the real world. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> what the heck is it? So, uh, you know, I hypothecated yeah. my house the other day. What the heck does that mean? You know, I put it up as collateral for a loan. You know, I mean, there's just a lot of words you just don't use. And if you don't know the definition, it's pretty tough to guess. You just got to learn that vocabulary. I like to learn. So, oh, flash sorry. Yeah. Flashcards help. It seems like the books, there are like so many books. I don't even know. Yeah, I know. 
if I need to go through all of them or mainly more videos? Would our, be our, manual, our manual is fantastic. You know, Dan's put a lot of work into that manual and it is really, really good. The, and the quizzes in the manual are really good too. Okay, sounds good, okay. thank you. Appreciate one you guys. Thing, uh, one thing real quick on that question is on the exam outline that we were talking about a little bit in the beginning, it tells you on here how many questions there are on each topic. So if you look at these, you can find like this is the Utah outline and it says that the uh, real estate uh, licensee practice has the most questions of any other topic on the Utah part of the exam. And if you go to the practice exams in the course, they are divided in the same categories that this exam outline is divided into. So on those exams, you can focus on the things where there's a lot of questions, or if you take a quiz and find that you don't know the material very well, the quizzes point you right to the chapters where you can go back and uh, review the videos on those topics that you feel like you're struggling on. And if you are struggling on anything, then please just uh, give us a call. We can talk with you through any of it and, and hopefully put you in the right track. Okay, sounds good. Um, where can I find that outline? That you showed me. So it's it's uh, provided by Pearson View, but if you're on our school website under uh, Utah classes on the link that talks about scheduling your license exam, there's a link right on that page to the exam outline, and you can just print it out and kind of use it as a study guide to see what you should focus on. Okay, thank you. Hey, great questions. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks everyone. We're going to wrap it up here. Appreciate you all being here. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.